So, Suzanne, maybe one way to start this conversation yes. would be to ask you, how did you get involved in public schools in Seattle? Uh, you know, from the start all the way through your school board service and beyond, if you wish. Yeah. Uh, to start, I guess I was a product of Seattle schools, uh, having gone through them from kindergarten through high school. And um, then when I had children, they went to public schools. Uh, my husband went to public school. So it seemed like public school was just part of the way of, of uh, being educated in Seattle. And uh, I was always uh, very sensitive to the teachers that had been very helpful uh, to me and always wanted to learn how to read and everything. And if it wasn't for them, I feel that wouldn't have happened. And you wouldn't be here today. And I wouldn't be here today <laughs> without them. So how did you get involved in the politics of local uh, the schools? The politics of school came about probably more when I had children uh, because through it was beginning with the PTA, but that didn't last too long. For me, it was too calm. And uh, then there was a pretty progressive superintendent when my children came to school, uh, Forbes Bottomley, who had been brought here from Colorado. And he started a lot of creative programs, innovative programs, and my children were uh, involved or going to be the recipient of them should they come to fruition. And so that kind of started the involvement. But I had been pretty involved in southeast Seattle, where I lived at the time, and really began to see the relationship of the schools to the whole community and vice versa. Would it be fair to say that southeast Seattle is a, a racially diverse part of the city? Yes, it would be. Uh, it uh, borders on the south end of Seattle, the south boundary. And it, it, the area, particularly in southeast Seattle, where I lived, was very affected by uh, proximity to Boeing production plants. So there were persons that uh, came to this area to live because of of the Boeing brought them here, and uh, and I had seen that really when I was in high school because I was in high school during World War II, and saw a great migration brought to Seattle for working on the docks and at Boeing, and it, it's interesting, but. When I reflect on it, Mike, I think that's where the interest came in probably desegregation later because going to a Seattle high school, and which was near Boeing, I saw a big migration of particularly blacks who came from the South. They were not allowed to be on production line at Boeing, but they could work on the docks and they could do other chores. But where I lived and went to school, there was a big concentration. And you began to see within the Seattle schools where the delineation of the students, uh, particularly the black students, they were concentrated in some parts of Seattle. And one of them was where I was in school. Mm -hmm. And I also experienced in elementary school of seeing all the Japanese children I went to school with being forcefully led out of this area to go to internment camps. And I think that probably two big things that made a difference. So it sounds like those, those warriors were important in terms of the formative experiences of not only uh, students of black descent, but also Japanese descent. Seattle also had Chinese uh, community even before World War II, correct? Yes, they did, because uh, some of those persons, uh, they were brought here from China to build the railroad. Right. And then 
after the railroad was built, they put them back on the train and took them, <laughs> wanted them to go back to China. But some escaped. <laughs> okay. And some stayed here. And we're fortunate that they did. But the Chinese community was really during that time when they were brought here as forced labor mm -hmm. many years ago. Do you think the uh, those shared experiences during the World War II years affected how people related to each other later on when Seattle went into school desegregation? It, it could have played a role because I do remember in World War II, uh, people wore buttons, I am Chinese or I am Filipino because a lot of Caucasians couldn't tell uh, what race they were. And I think uh, I remember that quite distinctly. Of uh, it, it, it did play a role. And I think there was a lot of feeling of persons in this area who really were very saddened to see the Japanese moved. Uh, however, they didn't do the uprising against it either. Mm -hmm. that we would probably see today. Uh, it was just the government said to do it, and I think everybody was so stunned at the beginning at Pearl Harbor. And uh, it was a very traumatic time, but our Japanese community was uh, thrust. But then we had, at the era of that we're here talking about in desegregation, then at that time, we were having the influx of people from Vietnam. And later Cambodia. Yes, whole different. Right. Uh, and they were very frightened of busing. Uh, I remember having some meetings in some homes working through an interpreter because they had seen their children put on buses and they never came home. Right. I think I remember hearing from my parents who, who both were same age uh, mm -hmm. during World War II that, you know, there was a lot of uh, ignorance about the life experiences of people who are not Caucasian right. going in, but they were impressed by how uh, bravely, how patriotic the black Americans and the Japanese Americans, the right. Chinese Americans all were during the World War II years, even, even though the country had you know, by a lot of measures, treated them rather poorly. And, and I wondered if you noticed anything like that when, the, you know, the, the relatives of the Japanese attorneys went to fight in, in Europe, uh, whether th that experience helped whites in Seattle understand where the minority people were coming from. Oh, uh, I think... Uh Perhaps with the Japanese returned, the soldiers and things, uh, because many of them were in the service, had been in, taken out of internment camps. Uh, and um, there is an organization now in Seattle that really works in writing about the men, and we've had books written about the men, the Asian uh, descent who went, and I... We Refuse, I think, by Frank Abe, who used to be a Cairo TV or Cairo yes. radio reporter. And uh, the man who wrote the book Boys in the Boat, he mm -hmm. wrote oh. a book most recently about the soldiers. Okay, and, uh, I haven't seen that and, yet. And the Japanese, uh, some of them I've spoken to who returned, uh, they would be used in uh, areas where they could go and not be seen by Japanese soldiers, but could hear them talk, and they didn't talk like people who had learned Japanese uh -huh. from a language school. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I think that was uh, a big, and, you know, even out where I lived in, in southeast Seattle, there was a big, uh, the man had a big nursery, uh, and when they left for camp, it was the neighbor's who took care of the nursery while they were gone. And like in our 
Central or International District, the Hego, <laughs> which is still there, the Hego store, and white Caucasians took over. And kept it? Kept after, it going and kept it so it wasn't ransacked. and Gave it back like, after the yes. war? See, that's different than in the Yakima Valley, where I'm from, mm -hmm. uh, the Filipino farms or, and other uh, Asian people's land was taken over uh, and never given back. Yeah. And it was just stolen. Um, well, with so, that with that mix of people, uh, how, how did it play out? Were, were the uh, respective discrete uh, racial or ethnic communities active in the in the lead up to school desegregation in Seattle what did they play separate or unified in, in roles in the in the citizens group uh, a committee there were were particularly some japanese involved in that uh, i think of a couple of names that come to mind but uh, and the difference in seattle than so many cities uh, we had black leadership among the black pastors who were willing to, who worked with other pastors of other faiths where they're predominantly white or non-black. And we also had the Rotary Club, the city leadership, the government. We had all of these groups that were encouraging Seattle to move forward with desegregation without a court order. And how, how did that uh, play out uh, in, in light of the prior experience in other cities? You, you've mentioned our mayor and what he thought he'd picked up from some of his uh, Yes, from Mayor White mayors. of Boston. And I remember Wes Ullman would say, we don't want Boston. We don't want Boston. And... Uh, I think that made a difference, and the Rotary Club and the the major groups that were are part of the decision makers of the community. We didn't have opposition from, a, and that is makes a great deal of difference. Now, is it because we all eat the right way in Seattle? I don't know, or drink a lot of coffee now, but. Uh, there was a willing, and I think part of it is is our polit politics at that time. We weren't so hardened in our party politics, right? Because we would elect Democrats and Republicans, and people who would come from other areas were amazed. And leaders in both parties were yes. uh, supportive of the effort to and that, go into desegregation makes, without the courts. That makes a very big difference here. Is it because we were geographically removed from those cities of the South and the East Coast where they had the problems? Was that it? Was it just a different political temperament? I think so. I think that made a difference. Um, yeah, and among the leadership, uh, as you were mentioning, is was the I think the church council, church council, religious leaders, uh, mm -hmm. uh, not not just uh, you know white Protestant ones, but right uh, black across, leadership across was the gamut. Yeah. Very important. Both the daily newspapers were right. editorially very yeah. supportive, almost yeah, pushy at times. I think it I was think perceived. We'd have to go back as well to the superintendent that we had probably when some of these early discussions began, Forbes Bottomley, who had come here from Colorado. But during his time here, he tried some things that were really the beginnings of desegregation, but in a very uh, non-judgmental way, I'll use that term, where students from the central area of Seattle they could go to high school in Bellevue uh, across the lake, which was then predominantly white. Uh, they could do movement, and that would be allowed. You know, they were trying this in some parts of the country, but he affected those relationships with other superintendents. And then they went into the middle school movement where the movement could occur 
you you could live in one part of the city, go to another part of the city for middle school. So he did some things that were, in retrospect, probably not so subtle, but subtle at that time. But it was beginning to say we can move from one geographic area to another. But he was, I, I think it was very carefully crafted. And even so, some serious opposition occurred even in those early years, right? I mean, yes. there, there was an attempted recall of the recall school board of the members school board, who but it supported failed. that. Right, that narrowly. Was that, yeah. But it did fail. Yeah. I think that was the yeah. difference. So there was and, a taste uh, of what was to come yeah. later just in the, in the skirmishing over those relatively limited... And we were uh, having... Uh, we were Certainly we had difficulties in some of the schools... Uh, teenagers, but that that would have gone on anyway. But uh, the maybe the only thing I really remember was the Panthers walking into one high school, and uh, that was uh, and the school district at that time responded with SWATs, God, uh, guards, etc. But then I remember. Forbes Bottomley again, uh, I went to a meeting on a Sunday night with the chief of police, the head of the fire department, uh, a few other parents. Should we open that high school on Monday morning or not? And if we did, should the, the, uh, the, the heavily guarded police be there, the SWATs, God, or, God, mm -hmm. or whatever they call them? And we said no. And Forbes provided the leadership at that time. And, but he integrated this group of the city and parent group and others of how do we react to this. But it was, we're going to get over it, but we're not going to make it a big physical presentation of the SWAT team being on every floor of the high school, et cetera. And so it's... When I think back on it, Mike, it's like there were this series of these little things that were big at the time independently, but they were little. When you put that all together, you were developing an, an atmosphere in the community of we can work together. Right, and as that was going on, in my recollection, legally <clears throat> around the country after the Supreme Court, especially the Supreme Court's decision in the Keys case from Colorado in 74, I think, uh, a lot of circuit courts all around the country were mandating uh, forced busing desegregation yes. plans. And and that was uh, seemed to be a trend. Every place where that was tried... There was an initial belief that, well, we're so pure here, we can't be guilty of intentional yes. segregation. But as the dominoes kept falling around the country, that affected the perception of political <clears throat> uh, leaders, including the school board in, yeah. in Seattle. What, what can you say about uh, the citizen committee that was formed in the mid-'70s yeah. and, and developed, developed the plan? Vital. It was... Uh a group of mothers, frankly. Uh, some men were involved, too, Tokens. I must say, especially a couple from the university, yeah. like Dick, Dick Andrews, Andrews yeah. et cetera. Um, and they became a Citizens Committee for Quality Integrated Education, CQIE, I remember. And uh, they played a big role because they were primarily parents who lived in other parts of the city than the southeast where we mm -hmm. had more uh, concentration and uh, of non-whites. And uh, they played a big role because they were like uh, the emissaries and because many of them had their own children uh, were moving them into other schools, parts of the district, because they believed in it. But they were also decision makers or form could formulate opinions of people in their various neighborhoods so what's behind parents 
uh, kind of nominating their own children to move voluntarily for the sake of well, desegregation. That's not a matter of forced court-ordered no. busing, but why would people do that? I mean, what's well, what's that, behind the idea that integrated education is a good thing? Can you be, speak to that? Well, I think one thing, uh, I'm going to go back to Forbes Bottomley, but before we did any real movement, it was the middle school program. We could make it available to you, parent. Uh, you could Your child can go to another part of the city, and there'll be this kind of a program. And we're going to make models, and not elementary, but the middle school age, like six through eight. And he began that movement. They began. So you began to see parents who lived in North Seattle, which is predominantly white, moving into the central area because there was a special program they wanted for their student and but vice versa. What was special about it? I mean, why, why do people want their kids to go to an integrated school? Why not? I mean, they can read any, they learn to read anywhere, right? But why? they were offering special classes as well. You know, maybe it was more, uh, we were going to offer a foreign language, which is not offered in your school. We were going to do something. It's kind of the forerunner of what became the big thing of magnet schools. But he began it with middle schools. And because we are moving your elementary child, but this gives them an opportunity to go. So we had children from North Seattle going into the central area to school. But, but why would you want them to in the first place? I'm trying to get it. What is it about desegregated education that some people might think is better than segregated education? Well, I think there was two things there. To some parents, it was desegregation, and that was important that my child had the opportunity to learn to interact with everybody. But for the carrot is we're going to offer a special program there. Sure. Maybe it's music. Maybe it's Latin. Maybe it's something that no other school has. So and some special programs. Special programs. But and in we service, saw, go, go yeah. ahead. And you, we saw in some parts of the country the the real magnet school concept. Mm -hmm. And and I think that was a forerunner of it. And But he did it in a casual way. You know, you can participate or not. Right. But, and then uh, you had some of these citizens who were beginning to work toward a more integrated education for their child, and they saw that as an opportunity. For their kids. Yes. So they wanted their kids to the go to school in a mixed environment. With a more accelerated program in X, Y, or Z, whatever mm -hmm. it may be. Does that relate at all to visions for how a democratic society ought to raise its kids? I mean... Why does, why does it matter whether you go to a school with kids from other backgrounds or not? Is, is it to give them experience interacting with each other so that they can be more effective citizens in a democracy? Is that part of it? Uh, I, I think so. Among the parents that were really involved in that, I think they were people who were very aware that my child is not going to be living in an all-white world. And we had so many things politically <clears throat> happening in the community as well. In the, by the community, I mean the country of uh, who gets into college. Mm -hmm. That's big press thing that get, get captures our attention. Opportunity, uh, the the force to the colleges who gets in, who doesn't get in. You know, you had all these dynamics happening. And uh, television was becoming very prominent, so you didn't have to read the paper, or you didn't have to listen to the radio. <clears throat> Sorry to have to say <laughs> that here. But, uh, you know, it was coming to them with television, where a lot of people were getting their news, but they were... Some of the parents, and, and, you know, we would be less than honest, Mike, if we didn't know that we had people move 
out of Seattle because of it, because my child will never go to school, be forced to go to school. Yeah, we've talked about the early uh, plans in Seattle. What what did the school board adopt when while you were on the board in the, in the mid-70s? It became a, a bigger program, right, the school desegregation program? Yeah. Well, I think uh, part of it is because of your office, the legal office. There were threats that there was going to be a lawsuit brought against Seattle on that they had taken action to have segregated schools because of school boundary lines, if I remember correctly. And student assignment yes, policies. Yes, student assignment. Uh, and uh, your legal office was very good at talking in a very modulated voice to the school board about what happens if it's a court order? What does that mean? What will you have to say about where the children go? What will you have to say to parents? They're making us do it, not you want to do it. What, what do you see about the relationship, if any, between segregated schools and segregated neighborhoods? Uh, well, you know, if I could roll the, the time back today, uh, I can see so many things that uh, in our city, it was the freeway, the major freeway came through, uh, Interstate 5 sliced through some of the neighborhoods. Um, then we had... Uh, Becoming a barrier to people moving and going uh, to school? We went or? through certain areas of the city. We cut them up, and, and we had... Uh, uh, we have areas... So I guess my point is that there were certain actions by the city and perhaps a state or whatever, but the city primarily, in its city planning, you created very isolated, segregated neighborhoods. Well, and, and even the federal government in, in the, you know, funding mortgages for post-war home buyers required that those mortgages be, be uh, limited to segregated neighborhoods. Right. Uh, so and the it wasn't just the city, it was the federal government. And the insurance companies would not insure and the banks. certain homes. You could get a loan. Right. And so there were, uh, it's it's more than the school district. The school district just reaped uh, the harvest, I'll say, of all these ill-planned or ill-thought-out things. And, and we still do it. This is the part that is so discouraging to me. We still do it. We still do it because I can see it in our city, sound transit, uh, you're putting in a light rail system. We put in the I-90 bridge to, the, to build the bridge to go across to Mercer Island, et cetera. We slice through some neighborhoods, make people move, but we tend to go into neighborhoods where it's primarily persons of color. Mm -hmm. And we still do it today. We still do it. And that's, you know, if, if we were to project ourselves for 10, 20 years from now, we should be saying the school district, and does the city believe in an integrated schools, public schools. Yeah, to me it's never made much sense that all of these other actors are out there helping to produce the conditions of segregated residential areas, but it all falls to the schools only to yes. fix it. Uh, but not the as, city as planners. Opposed, uh, yeah, so, I mean, if I were the chief lawyer, you know, uh, oh, you are. now... <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think I'd be interested in losses not against school districts to desegregate their schools only, but more comprehensively 
uh, to try to get all of the relevant actors to contribute to the solution in a, in a coordinated way. And, you know, it's, it's possible that uh, that kind of an approach could uh, secure voluntary compliance by the whole range of actors, but if it didn't, it's also possible, or at least was uh, within the legal frame framework of 40, 50 years ago, uh, that uh, a comprehensive remedy could have been court ordered just the way the courts went after school districts. So that mm -hmm. I think we're on the same page that yeah. a lot, a lot was missing in the attempts to overcome and, and, uh, the uh, bad effects of, yeah, and, of segregation. And, to repeat myself, but it, we still see it happening. Right. You know, uh, we can think of parts of Seattle where uh, the, to build the bridge to go across to Mercer Island and Bellevue uh, bisected, uh, took out a huge chunk, and the school district had to sell one of its buildings to the highway department because that's where the they thought the new road would go. And then it was in litigation for 20 years, and you were dealing with a school. So it's really, if we're going to change it in the future, it really is going to have to be the joining of hands of do we want to have integrated neighborhoods? It's going to take the joining of hands of where we put highways, where we build, what we build. But that kind of comprehensive planning isn't occurring. Right. Yeah. Just to complete part of the story, we, we got to where the school board adopted a comprehensive yeah. plan. What, what happened immediately after that? Uh, I mean, was there, did everybody meekly accept it or did... Some people the, oppose They were it. moving. Some people moved uh, in schools that were affected. I think one thing that helped in, in the Seattle plan was that schools moved so we didn't take just the black children or just the white children or just the Asian children to move. We moved whole neighborhoods. Like if you went to school X... School X would be paired with another school, uh, so I think and the that first made and first through one through three grades would go to one location, right. and and uh, and then four through six they'd go to the but other. But it would location be all together. the children, not just the children of color, right. or like we read about that occurred in parts of the country. Right, and uh, I think that made a difference. That was really important. At least it was to me, but I think to other people on the board as well, that communities, uh, so that they stay with children they know, they all ride the bus together. I mean, today, my God, with the traffic the way it is, there's no way in God's green earth you'd be busing all these kids all over. But uh, right, but it, it's interesting to me that the the big parts of the Seattle plan that was adopted in the mid. 70s lasted 30 years without a court intervention yeah. until the U.S. Supreme Court kind of yeah. whacked the uh, ability to keep anything much going. <clears throat> uh, that, that was, I think, in 2006. So it was yeah. really practically 30 years, uh, which to me seems, you know, given the experience uh, around so much else of the country, a pretty unique story for a bigger city. I mean, there are I think lots of examples of smaller places that have taken steps voluntarily to integrate mm -hmm. their educational programs. But but uh, Seattle, I, I think, to some important degree, stands out a bit uh, uh, with cities of comparable size. and, and uh, Well, I think, uh, you know, I will say this, that we've had political leadership of the of the city and somewhat of the state where we've never had to fight really until there was that one effort to stop transportation money being used way back when, which you argued before the Supreme Court, I recall very well. And 
recall the what question from Supreme Court justices that stood out in my mind when Thurgood Marshall asked, how many people in your state legislature are people of color? And the Secretary of State had to say, one. And Thurgood Marshall sat down and smiled. <laughs> and that was yeah. the end of that. And that's one of about 150, I think, legislators in, in the state of Washington. Yeah. So, yeah. so he made the point very he effectively. He made the point yeah. very effectively and uh, without a lot of words. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, are, are we today a segregated school district? And, you know, and, and, and during all of this, we had a big influx of refugees from Vietnam because they were, this was an area where a lot settled. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember meeting with some of those parents through an interpreter to try to explain to them about the bus. And their concern was, if we put them on the bus, they'll never come home. Because that's what they had experienced in their own country. Right. And, uh, you know, and... I think that's the other thing. We were a city of Filipinos, Chinese, Japanese. It wasn't just black population. Yeah, it wasn't a, a two community and, problems, so to speak. Right, and and then we have a lot of South Pacific Islanders here as well, and concentrated in some parts of the city. And uh, so it's it's hard to compare us to some other parts of the country. Uh, although I remember we went down to testify in some case in Denver, wasn't it, I think? The NACB was suing the Denver School District, and they wanted us to come down, and you brought me down there. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Just do it, Denver. <laughs> and uh, I... You know, it's it's a it's a part of history, but there's so many lessons to be learned. But we learned that it's a societal issue regarding city planning, city development, uh, businesses, etc. My sense was that uh, even though lots could have been done much better. Uh, and there are problems all, all along the way. The city as a whole is still better for those 30 years of contact with each other. And I think it has enhanced the ability of the people of Seattle and their descendants to interact with people whose backgrounds are different from their own. And, yes. And to, uh, you know, to keep, there's, uh, I, th I think it has, has enhanced the, the likelihood that the city can uh, be successful in a democratic form of government because of what we learned together from those years. Yes, I, I think that's really important to remember that it wasn't just a period of time, but it it's a little chink of the history that still is growing today. And, uh, you know, our surrounding school districts are facing a lot of this. I mean, especially when you have companies like Microsoft who brought in so many people from other countries. And so the schools on the east side of the lake are, there's a lot of, they should do more integrating as well. But uh, the, it, did we learn? I learned a lot. Would I do it again? Yes. Would I do it more vigorously? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would not, I would continue to work very, very closely with the city government. I think I spent most of my time with the city government and, and the clubs like the Elks and the Rotary and who were the community decision makers here? That made a big role, big difference. You did a nice job. <laughs> oh, we're still alive. <laughs> yeah.